Our world is largely digital today, comprised of ones and zeros, and values are represented in binary. And for a lot of purposes, these two options are enough. But what about applications that require an analog output after some digital processing? For example, when we play music from our phones or computers, it comes out as an analog signal. My digital function generator creates analog signals as well. But how can we convert the two-state binary into the infinite possibilities of analog? To do such a thing, we can use a DAC, or a digital to analog converter. You may be familiar with the term ADC, or analog to digital converter, and they both do essentially the same thing, but in the reverse order. But DACs are oftentimes left out of some microcontrollers, and you'll have to find a way to implement one yourself. The best option oftentimes is just to buy a DACIC. But what if you are curious in how to make one yourself? Well in this video, I will show you how to make one of the most popular methods to create a DAC and ultimately use it to create our own function generator from scratch. Before we get into the construction of the DAC, let's quickly review how binary and digital logic work for those who are still unfamiliar. In binary, there are only two states, meaning that we use a base 2 counting system. Let me give you an example counting from 0 to 5. 0 is 0 and 1 is 1 of course. But in order to increment the number again, we have to add another digit, because remember there's only a 1 and a 0. So 2 would be represented as 1, 0, and 3 as 1, 1. And to add another 1, we have to add another digit, so it ends up as 1, 0, 0, and finally 5 is 1, 0, 1. I hope you see the pattern. It really is quite simple, but it can be a little confusing if you are new to seeing this. Anyways, one of the most popular methods to construct a DAC that will take those binary numbers that we just discussed and turn them into an analog signal is the R to R ladder. Its name represents the values of resistors that we'll be using to construct it. So drawing a 2-bit R to R ladder, we can see the pattern that it uses already. Each input is connected through a resistor that is twice as large as the ones that are in the column. The basic idea of how this works is using a binary number, we can generate a fraction of the input high voltage. Let's give an example using these two bits. Let's input 2 or a 1 0 into the DAC, which get a voltage that is about two thirds of the high voltage. I find it helpful to think of the DAC as a device that can convert binary fractions into analog fractions. So using two bits, we have four possible different voltage outputs, all within the range between the low and the high voltages. The more bits you add, the more voltage steps you can create using the DAC. So in other words, you'll have a higher resolution. With eight bits, you can make 256 different steps and with 10 bits, you can make 1024 steps and so on and so forth. Each extra bit you add doubles the resolution. Now that we know the basic workings of the DAC, let's build it up on a breadboard to see if it actually works. I'll be using 1K and 2K resistors for my R and 2R resistors. They are both of a 1% tolerance so that we can get as accurate of an output voltage as possible. You can use higher tolerance resistors, just keep in mind that you might get varying output voltages due to the varying resistance. I built the DAC up to 8 bits because AVR microcontrollers run 8 bit CPUs. Anyways, running a quick manual test, we can see that inputting 128, which is about half of 255, gives us a voltage that is close to half of 5 volts. Anyways, let's connect the DAC to port D on the Atmega 8A microcontroller. Now we can conveniently write numbers to the code and control the exact output of the DAC instead of manually changing it. Now that we have the microcontroller controlling the DAC, Let's make it generate some functions for us. Starting off, I'll make the simplest function that I can think of, the ramp oscillator. To generate this, I simply just incremented port D over and over again, and the overflow causes it to go back to zero after it reaches 255. More advanced is the triangle wave, which is just the same as the ramp, but it also comes back down. The square wave is extremely simple, and it really doesn't even require a DAC, but I included it just because we need a function generator. Finally, I had one more function to generate, and the channel is named after it, in fact. The sine wave. Now this wave was more difficult to generate than the others because we needed to run some trigonometry. To make this easy for the AVR to run, I pre-calculated a table of sine values on my PC. Basically, the values 0 to 255 were converted into radian values from between 0 and 2 pi. Then we took the sine of that and added 1 to it, so that we didn't have to deal with any negative values. Finally, the resulting value was then compared back to the values from 0 to 255. These values were mapped to a table so that the AVR could look up which angle corresponds to which output voltage. I know the whole process to generate the sine wave was a bit complicated, so I've added both the microcontroller and the PC code in the description. Now while we can generate functions, a proper function generator will allow us to alter the frequency. So I added a potentiometer to act as a voltage divider, connected the middle of it to the ADC on ADC pin 0. 
This will now give us values from 0 to 255, which we can use to determine what frequency to run the waves at. To make this work, I set up the internal timer 0, which will either slow down or speed up the functions as necessary. Basically, the functions work one step at a time, and they will only progress when the timer allows them to do so. And we can determine how quickly the timer executes by setting its internal value. Again, the code is in the description. While all this function generating works as expected, what use is it if we can't even attach a load? Currently, attaching a load such as a speaker will completely break down the output voltage because the currents flowing through the DAC also have the power of the load. So in order to preserve the output voltage, we need an op amp buffer. In this case, I will use the LM358. However, there is still one problem. The LM358 cannot go all the way up to the positive rail, meaning that the top half of our DAC output will be cut off. So I divided the output at the DAC in half by using a resistor divider with a very high value 100k resistors. Now our output is from 0 to 2.5 volts, because the op amp is capable of dealing with these voltages with only a 5 volt supply. One more step to make the op amp drive any load is an output NPN transistor. The op amp will maintain the voltage and the transistor will power the load. The schematic is in the description if you are confused on how the circuit is wired up. Anyways, we can now connect the speaker again and listen to our functions. I like the way the ramp sounds, and the triangle sounds just like a digital sine wave. Now that we have a generator working, it is time to solder it together and make it a little more reliable. So after soldering all the resistors and the other components together on the perf board, we can test it again, only to see that it is working great. Just to note, I also added a button to allow us to change the current function so that we don't have to modify the code each time we want a different function. While this was a fun experiment and taught us a lot about DICs and R2R ladders, I would personally just use a dedicated DAC on more serious projects for their better accuracy and higher bit count. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video and have found it helpful, please consider subscribing so that you can see all the other videos that I make. Have a good one!